Welcome to B2B Marketers on a Mission, a podcast for B2B marketers that helps you to question the conventional, think differently, disrupt your industry, and take your marketing to new heights. Each week, we talk to B2B marketing experts who share inspirational stories, discuss their thoughts on trending topics, and provide useful marketing tips and recommendations. And now, here's your host and co-founder of I'm Like Consulting, Christian Klepp. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of the B2B Marketers in the Mission podcast, where you get your weekly dose of B2B marketing insights. I'm your host, Christian Klepp, and today it's an absolute pleasure to welcome a guest into the show, who I would say is a bit of a serial entrepreneur and a Swiss army knife in all things B2B SaaS marketing and sales. So coming to us from beautiful Lisbon, Portugal, Mr. Mark Colgan, welcome to the show. Hey, Christian, thank you so much for having me. Really looking forward to having this conversation. Me too. And I, I really hope I did you um, justice with that mini introduction. And uh, I'll leave the rest of it over to you in, in terms of like telling your life story. Let's uh, l- let's just jump straight into it, Mark, because, you know, we had such a great uh, conversation a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, you know, on a topic that, A, you're clearly passionate about, B, which I think is equally impressive, um, you've built a successful business around. So um, it's podcasting for B2B. And more specifically, if I remember that conversation correctly, it's it's about why people in the B2B world should be um, guests on podcasts or should speak on podcasts. So tell us about why you think that's so important. Sure. And, and you know, I'm not trying to discourage anybody from starting their own podcast as well. Um, obviously, you've, uh, you've got your own podcast here, which you do a fantastic job. You get to speak to so many people. Um, but I believe that speaking on podcasts is a great um, first step in the right direction of increasing your brand awareness through the medium of podcasts. And the reason why I believe it's so uh, important for B2B brands, especially in 2021, is that even in this modern world that we we work in um, and that we live in, people still buy from people that they know, like, and trust. And speaking on podcasts really allows you to speed up the process of building brand trust um, because you're leveraging the audience of the podcast host. So whether you're, or the audience that you're speaking to is 300 people, 3,000, 30,000 people, it's already a pre-built audience that are tuning in to listen to the host talk to guests. And usually that guest is a industry expert or maybe somebody a little bit famous or an influencer. Um, And it really acts as a third party endorsement for you and your brand. It's not like the reviews or testimonials that you put on your own website. It's almost like the Google reviews or the Captera and G2 reviews that you gain from your customers. And the reason why I'm mentioning reviews is it's because it's really important that we remember in 2021 that brand is still such a such an important channel that a lot of B2B brands aren't focusing on enough. Um, I we I think when we spoke the other week, I mentioned about the two most recent software purchases that I went through. Both um, both software that I I purchased, I didn't. Uh, read any ebook of theirs. I rarely spent any time on their website, but I asked my network of who do they recommend? Who do you recommend for an applicant tracking system? What what software do you recommend for uh, anonymous surveys and feedback for my team? And it was people that influenced my decision, not the marketers, not 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 the actual company itself. So I think as you realize that that is still the way that people do business, I, I'm in the Revenue Collective, which is a Slack community. I think over 3,000 people and there isn't, there isn't an hour across all those channels in a day where somebody doesn't say, can anybody recommend a payroll system? Can anybody recommend a marketing automation tool? What's the best email outreach tool? Now, as you mentioned, I'm a Swiss army knife. I've got a sales background as well. There are 30, uh, I would say 30 reputable cold email outreach tools that uh, I've pretty much used all of them, uh, at least to a, to a small degree. Um, and the few that I constantly recommend to people are the brands that stay top of mind with me. So they're not only brands that I, uh, software that I've used, but it's also Reply.io who are, reduce, who are uh, releasing feature after feature and tool after tool. And they're constantly serving their audience with value. Um, and they're the B2B brands that are going to win in 2021 and beyond. Yeah, you you definitely brought up um, a lot of uh, great insights there. Let me start start with the uh, the bit about staying top of mind, right? And staying top of mind doesn't necessarily mean you just keep harping on about your the, the like you said like uh, about the products and services that you um that you're pushing out into the market. It's also about adding value to that um, 
to that target market, that, that target audience. Like, how do you want them to remember you? Yeah. And you brought up another really important piece. And this is not necessarily just for B2B. It's just, you know, in general, it's getting, uh, it, it's through word of mouth. It's through recommendations. It's through, I, I would call it like the, uh, the, uh, the two cents worth from industry colleagues. You know, you put something mm -hmm. out there and say, hey, which, which uh, you know, to your point earlier, which software would you recommend? And then people will come back with, you know, um, their, their, their suggestions and their recommendations based probably also on their own experience on, you know, having used the platforms and, and whatnot. So it's a lot of these factors combined, right? Absolutely. No, no, 100% agree. Yeah, no, fantastic. Um, oh, you're going to have fun with this one. <laughs> um, you, you, you've been in this field for a bit, so you've probably seen a lot of things. And when I say a lot of things, I'm talking about um, mistakes and misconceptions, um, you know, that people have when it comes to podcasting. So, uh, you know, talk to us about that and what you believe uh, people should do to address those. Yeah, well, I'm no angel, Christian. I've, I've seen the mistakes and made the mistakes myself. Um, yeah. <laughs> but the one, the, the one I see come up time and time again, especially with podcasting, is that Marketers, um, especially B2B marketers, they are uh, comparing the reach of a podcast uh, interview with that of a return on ad spend or looking at number of visits to a website. But it's completely different because if you get the relevancy right and you're speaking to a highly targeted audience. Um, now, your, your podcast is an example where I would say the majority of your listeners are B2B marketers because the show is called uh, called B2B Marketers on the Mission. You've right. got uh, B2B marketers that you bring on and you talk about B2B marketing. So yep. there's a high chance that there are B2B marketers listening to this show. And if your audience size was 100 people or 300, um, which is still relative, which is still a successful number when it comes to podcasting, because a lot of podcasts don't reach that number at all. Um, I would much rather have this conversation with you. We talk for 35 minutes. We have a converse conversation. We have back and forth. I share as much value as I can with 300 people that I know are interested in learning more about B2B marketing versus trying to target people just because they have B2B marketing on their profile somewhere, some, somehow. Um, so going back to the, the, the mistake, it's really being focused on the audience size and comparing it to other channels. And, and what a lot of people forget about podcasting as well is that it lives forever. It's evergreen. So people discover your interviews that you, you, you do with podcasts in the future. I had somebody contact me on LinkedIn just the other week now from a podcast episode that went live in 2019. And what I love about this is that I was on there talking about solving a specific challenge. That person currently has that challenge. And he reached out to me to say, I really appreciated your, um, your insights about lead sourcing. Um, could we set up some time to speak because I need some help with that. So if you position your topics and if you position what you talk about in the right way, and hopefully the uh, pod, one thing that you can't control as a guest is how well the podcast host will market the, the, uh, the episode and how, what, how they name um, all of the, uh, the episodes. But if it's done in the correct way, uh, there's an intent behind somebody listening to that podcast. And the last thing, Christian, that a lot of people forget is that um, you can repurpose a lot of content from one 35-minute conversation or even one 15-minute conversation. You can chop uh, that interview into several pieces of video, several audio clips, as well as social media images. And you can even create blog posts for, out of it as well. And that's what we do for, for some of our customers too. So there's a lot of legs in podcasting. Um, just focusing on the audience size is the wrong way to think about it. Some really great points there, Mark. And I'll have to, uh, I'll have to say that I agree with all of them, um, simply because I've seen it in my own podcast as well. I mean, like, you know, back to your point. Um, there, there was one, uh, one person reached out to me a couple of months ago, um, you know, who's now become my client. And this is a person that did not engage with any of the content on LinkedIn, um, didn't reshare anything, but they saw it. Yeah. And they listened to the interviews, right? So, and I, and I think you know where I'm going with this. Uh, never underestimate the people that, um, you know, they're, they're there. Um, they see your content. They just don't necessarily engage with it. And that's okay, right? Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, uh, about uh, uh, repurposing uh, your content. And I'm going to quote uh, James Carberry at uh, Sweetfish Media. He keeps saying, um, <clears throat> get more juice out of the squeeze. <laughs> and that's mm -hmm. really what that mm -hmm. is, isn't it? Right? 
It is. And, and, you know, once you've repurposed that content and then it's up to you to distribute it. So a lot of people just think, OK, I'll share it on social media channels. But that's not only where you can uh, you can send it. You can use it in your sales outreach. So give that to your sales development reps or business development reps and have them initiate conversations around the podcast interview that the CMO or the CFO, whoever it was in your company, had uh, just 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 released and just shared. Um, you can use it in your email newsletter. You can use it in your customer marketing. You can use it in the, uh, what I love to use it for as well is deals that are in the pipeline that have stalled um, because you as, <clears throat> you as a salesperson, you're reaching out to say, hey, when will you buy from us? Uh, but nobody ever wants to receive that message. So you can use this content and say, hey, look, our, our CFO just spoke with this person on this podcast. They talked about these three challenges. I remember you mentioned that this is a challenge that you're facing. Hopefully this gives some insights. Skip to, skip to 12 minutes in because that's where it gets really juicy. Um, that is a much better engagement and a much better touch point to a prospect than just sending an email saying, is now a good time? Is now the right time? Or do you have time for a 15 minute demo call? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> no, no, I mean, that, that, that's such a great point that you bring up because, um, you know, by doing that, and I think this is this is where you were going with that, um, that piece is uh, that you're basically uh, being proactive or you're thinking, you're thinking with that client, you're thinking with that prospect, you're trying to like, um, you know, trying to imagine yourself in their shoes in that specific part of their, um, of their journey. Yeah, and if I can just add as well, I've I've been in the B2B marketing space for, for almost a decade now. And, and mm -hmm. I remember at the very beginning of my career, I worked for a data center design and build company. Mm -hmm. And podcasting is just podcasting as a channel just wasn't there. Yeah. I used to struggle every month to come up with content. Um, because it's highly technical. I'm not the technical design and uh, design and build engineer of a data center. However, had podcasting been an option around then, I could have spoke to all of the different engineers and asked the questions and asked about cooling and asked about the different types of cooling, uh, just as one category, for example, uh, power backup and all of these other, all of these kind of like, if I thought about how my blog blog should have been uh, segmented and categorized, I could have had conversations with people. They're the experts. I leveraged their experience bring that into and package it up under the branding of the company I was working for. And I have endless amount of content. In fact, I probably wouldn't have had enough time to produce all the content off, the, off those interviews. Um, so I think a lot of companies struggle with uh, content. And uh, again, I'm speaking more to this audience of the B2B here, Christian. The most simple content strategy is to create content that solves the problems that your prospects have. That's absolutely right. And I think, um, you know, like one of the uh, one of the key words in that sentence you just mentioned was um, package or packaging. Because, you know, I, I mean, I wouldn't say that marketing is just all about packaging, but it certainly is a, a large component of it, right? It's, it's, it's how you package that. And I think that was such a great point that you brought up, so relevant to the listeners. Um, taking something, uh, you, you know, technical specifications or, or something that's of a very uh, technical nature and packaging it up in a digestible format that is easy for people to understand. Yeah, and there's two great examples that I'd love to share. I always try Please. and think of examples and, yeah. and things that people can check out when they listen. Mm -hmm. So um, Salesflare is a, uh, a CRM, uh, and it's, yeah. a, it's, a very good, it's a very good CRM. It's not a Salesforce. They're not trying to be Salesforce. It's a very easy and simple to use CRM. They know that the, that the majority of their buyers who haven't purchased a CRM yet are using a spreadsheet for their CRM or likely to be using a spreadsheet. So rather than Salesflare trying to convince people that they should ditch the spreadsheet and move to Salesflare, what they've done is they've created a, a awesome template, which is a spreadsheet, which you can download. And it's to say, look, if you're doing it this way, I'm not trying to change your mind, but here's just a better way of doing it in the spreadsheet. And when the spreadsheet doesn't have the automation and it doesn't do this and it doesn't do that, and that becomes an issue for you, come and talk to us because we can help you with that. Another example, uh, and I, I'm actually, I feel like there's a blog post in my mind that I want to write for this one, is uh, Dan Martel. Um, Dan Martel, relatively pretty well yeah. known in, in the SaaS industry. Yeah. Um, the content he creates, it's, it's a masterclass in content marketing. Um, he creates content which is, has, doesn't really have much to do with actually what he is trying to sell or mm -hmm. his coaching program. And I've heard amazing things about the coaching program as well. Yeah. But the, the, a few examples that come to mind uh, that he's released recently was 
20 really successful pitch decks from SaaS companies yep. that, raised, that managed to go on and raise funds. I think he shared 60 email templates 80. or sequences or 80, yeah. okay, 80. For, from yeah. Yeah. a B2B SaaS companies. <laughs> yeah, and um, yeah. The, the other one as well was a, a database of VCs and accelerators for SaaS companies. Yes. Now, does Dan create, does Dan, um, he's not a VC or accelerator uh, as, as far as I know. He's not an email marketing or a life cycle engagement service. Um, he's not a pitch deck creator, but he knows that those are the challenges that his customers have. And he's using that to be top of mind with them so that they download it. And of course, they go on to a nurture sequence and, you know, maybe nurture sequences aren't as, uh, aren't as effective as they used to be, especially mm -hmm. when you're selling to sales, marketing and on, uh, SaaS entrepreneurs, because we've just been exposed to them quite a lot. Yeah. But the, the point is, none of that content is what Dan and his team created. They just curated it. They pulled together and packaged it, again, going back to using that yes. word, um, in a really helpful way, but it's so helping his prospects solve challenges. Like I said, that he doesn't actually solve in the future, but he just knows that it's of interest. He knows that they need help with it. Yeah. And having that um, giving and servant sort of attitude to, to marketing mm -hmm. is really how you win uh, in, in, in 2021. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that that's really bang on. I don't like to use the word best practices, but you know, this is kind of what it is. Um, yeah. Tips on being a good uh, guest on a podcast. Cool. Okay. I'm going to fast forward the whole process and just assume that Please. you've landed a guest uh, spot on, on a podcast. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a few things that we would recommend. Um, and we, you know, we help our customers with this as well. Um, the, if you're doing so, I'm going to go give examples of if you're going to do it yourself. Um, listen to at least two episodes, uh, previous episodes. Um, Christian, if you remember, I asked you what was your favorite or what were some of your favorite or ones where you felt the audience would have yeah. got the most value. Didn't want to put you in too much of a difficult spot. No, 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 um, no. <laughs> but, you shared, but you shared a few links. So I listened to those and I'm trying to look for the patterns of what made that a great uh, interview for you. Um, and also, so once you've done that, because what you don't want to be done, you don't want to be caught we're off guard with some surprise questions at the end. Uh, it's happened to me before where there was a quick fire round right at the end of the interview, and I really didn't know uh, that that was coming up, and um, I was very unprepared, and it just didn't sound that great at the time. The other thing is, is to practice your topics that you want to talk about or that you've been asked to talk about as well. Um, I personally like to have a few bullet points that I can look at whilst having uh, the conversation. I still keep the communication quite informal, but they're just prompts for me to, to take a look at. Um, and then really practice the anecdotes and the stories that you're going to use to back up the points that you make as well. Um, do that. Uh, and the other thing that I would always suggest is to have a pre-interview conversation with the podcast host before, because you'll be able to start building rapport um, with the podcast host. You'll get, an un you'll get a feeling of um, not not only from listening to previous episodes, but having a live conversation, how their presentation style is. There are certain podcasts who uh, podcast hosts who just ask question, 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 question. There are other uh, uh, podcasts where you go completely off topic, and what you prepared for, uh, you never you never got round to speaking to. But just having looking that person in the eye on Zoom uh, and just getting a little bit familiar with them can really take the the edge off the actual interview, especially if you haven't done many of these before. Some great topics and some great. Um, uh, tips there. I was saying, <laughs> forgive me, but I, I, I was I was grinning and laughing to myself as you were as you were going down that list because man, I've I've experienced all of them. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I um, mean, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I think it it really does create um, a certain rapport, and you know, even if it's just for a while. But I, you know, uh, that's why I have them. You know, these these pre-interview calls because mm -hmm. I I get to know the guest and. Uh, um, you know, I don't, I, I don't want it to sound uh, suggestive, but you know, like just to get a feel of the dynamics and the chemistry, um, yeah. and, and, and just to see, because you, you know, I, I, again, at the end of the day, it has to feel like a conversation. Uh, you know, with the exception that we're talking about, you, you know, something that we do professionally, um, yeah, that we're passionate about. But, but other than that, it's like you know, it's it's, it's really about like, okay, uh, you know, how can we make this a great interview that 
people are going to walk away from and say, yes, um, you know, actually, that's those were great insights. That's something I didn't think about before. Mm. Yeah. And I think it's like when you see politicians on TV, you hear their interviews and you feel it's so rehearsed. They're dodging the questions uh, and you're just like, I don't like that person. Just based off that, uh, I am not prepared to answer that statement. Like that answer is not what you want to be giving when it comes to speaking on podcasts. Uh, but at the same time, if you get asked a difficult question and get another piece of advice, it's completely OK to say that, hey, look, I'm not the best person to to answer that question and uh, I, it wouldn't feel great I wouldn't feel great giving advice on something I don't feel too comfortable on and you know in the nine times out of ten that's absolutely fine no one's going to judge you for it no one's going to not uh, not trust you uh, if anything you've been more trust trustworthy because you've been honest and transparent yeah no that's absolutely right and you know we've we've seen it all before like whether it was in you know in webinars and uh, or or in um, in-person events back then where you've got these speakers on stage or or giving a presentation and then when the the questions either got too detailed or too technical um they had they they usually have a very clever way of deflecting it and saying like look um you know thank you for your question um i think at, at this point in time i i'm unable to answer that but perhaps we could take this offline or you know we can we can ha you know we can set up a, a, another time to talk about it but you know perhaps for the uh, you know in the interest of time and the audience perhaps we could just move on to another question or something mm -hmm. of that nature yeah certainly building a podcast versus being a guest on podcasts. Uh, which approach would you recommend and why? Yeah, I think <clears throat> it depends where you are uh, in your journey, um, how much budget and how much time you have as well. So there's no denying that building your own podcast and building your own uh, reputation around that podcast is going to be an, a huge advantage to you and your company. Um, but it does take a lot of time and investment from you. Um, from the preparation to the guest sourcing to the production to the distribution, uh, everything involved. That's why there's great companies like Sweetfish, which you mentioned earlier, who are there to produce the podcast, or you can do it yourself, uh, or VAs, whatever you decide. One of the biggest things that I see is that people start podcasts and then don't finish it, and uh, they don't continue. Um, and that often is because it's maybe just something they don't enjoy. It becomes too much of a chore. Um, so we have a lot of customers come to us that say, look, we're looking at exploring podcasting as a channel overall, and we would like to speak on podcasts first, see if we like it. And we've had some customers that have uh, worked with us for a campaign, and they've gone on to create their own podcast, which is fantastic. I've got another customer that is still thinking about doing a podcast, but he said, Mark, can we just double down on the amount of interviews that you book for me and just get me effing everywhere because I don't want my uh, prospects to see to go on LinkedIn and not see the content that's being repurposed. I don't want them to go onto a marketing podcast and not see my name and hear me talk about the, the amazing work we do with our customers. Um, so it's not for everybody. So that would be the first, the first thing. The second thing, the disadvantage about starting your own podcast is you do have to start from zero. Um, so you won't have a lot of listeners. You, um, you might struggle to get some guests on your show, especially if you're not a relatively well-known name or, or like uh, in, in the B2B world, or you're just starting out and you've got no social proof for people to hear previous episodes of, of the podcast. Again, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it based on that. Just be prepared that there's going to be a, a longer ramp up for it to become a little bit more easy uh, once you get into the flow of it. I'd say then the main benefit of speaking on other people's podcasts as a strategy is that you're leveraging other people's audience and you're leveraging the social proof of speaking on the podcast that somebody else has vouched for you. Because most podcast hosts, in fact, 99% of the podcast hosts do care about the quality of the guests that they have on their show. That's why they do the pre-interview conversations like you do, Christian. It's why they say no to some people that pitch and um, they, when, when, a, when we often give advice to people who are doing it themselves, you know, reaching out to podcast hosts and we're just like, don't make your pitch about you. It's not, it's not about you. It's about what value you could offer to the audience, because ultimately that's what the uh, podcast host is interested in. Um, so yeah, um, basically it's very, very low lift, but you can get a lot out of a single podcast interview from the content that you can repurpose. And all you've had to do is just turn up, do, do a little bit of prep, turn up and speak. There's, I, I can't think of any other marketing channel that gives you the same sort of distribution and positive ROI 
as of just speaking for half an hour. And also, Christian, it's a very intimate experience. We're humans. We've been telling stories for thousands of years. And uh, this is a storytelling narrative. Um, you're asking questions and, I, and I'm ask, asking them and we're going off topic and we're going on topic and I'm using examples. This is exactly how we've learned our, our whole lives as, as humans, as, as an adult now. Uh, we have constantly learned through stories and, and that's what podcasting enables you to do. But like your original question is build your own podcast or appear on others. If you want shorter term wins, go and appear on others and also test out to see if you like podcasting because it might not be for you and that's completely okay. Those are some really great answers, I have to say. Um, you know, and 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 incredible advice. Uh, I mean, like you know, clearly you're speaking. You know, this is the voice of experience speaking here. <laughs> Thank you. But um, yeah, no, you, you know, you brought up a couple of things. You know, in the past few minutes that really resonated with me, and uh, one of them being, uh, look, it's it's not just podcasting. It's pretty much everything when you're in business, right? That there has to be a certain degree of commitment you've got to you know you've got to put in the time you've got to put in the effort and the hours because like you said it's not a it's not a walk in the park um and and yes uh, not everybody is going to be a um the right fit for your uh for for the show and and and, and vice versa um and at the end of the day it's really about um adding value to the listeners like what can you uh you know what could you bring uh to the conversation that would help like you know let, let's let's use this podcast as an example you know for b2b marketers right and i found at least just from my own experience with podcasting um <clears throat> you know looking for guests and so forth i mean one one way is certainly to go through um you know people like yourself that you know provide this kind of services mm -hmm. the other one is I, I i found um people generally uh you know that i've that I've reached out to on platforms like LinkedIn, um, they tend to be more receptive when you ask them, um, you know, would you would you like to be a guest on um, on my podcast um, versus like, would you like to jump on a quick ten minute sales call? Sure, <laughs> sure. <laughs> Mark, I'm gonna drop a couple of statistics on you here, um, and uh, I'm I'm gonna get your thoughts about that afterwards. So we we know that like you know, and everybody keeps talking about this. They've been talking about this for at least the past year or so that we are at the beginning of this, what they call the podcasting wave. Um, and it's it's amazing like, like <clears throat> how how much the numbers have increased since the last time I had a look at them. But just to, just to give you, uh, just to put it into perspective, all right? Um, and I'm gonna assume there's a bit of like B2C uh, in these statistics of course, as well, yeah. right? Of course, um, YouTube channel, uh, YouTube channels as of 2020, there's about 37 million. Um, Facebook business pages, over 60 million. Um, blogs, oh, big surprise, over 600 million. Um, and podcast, over 2 million. But mm -hmm. obviously, like we, you know, we had this conversation before, that number will probably shrink uh, when you search by topic, right? So here comes the question. What is it about this recent search in podcasting that has surprised you? And I, and I mean surprised in a positive way, right? Let's focus on the uh, more constructive aspect of this. And where do you think we're headed? Uh, when it comes to podcasting okay good great question and christian i think i read a stat um yeah. and i can go off and just try and find the source just for for you if i'm going to say it out loud but i believe only out of the two million that are um podcasts uh i, I can't remember where that data comes from only six hundred thousand are considered as active so um, a lot of those podcasts are either um, on a seasonal, so they might be on a break because they uh, they do one season, then they break and then do a second season, or they've only had three or four episodes and, and, and then it's just completely fizzled out. What surprised me is that B2B brands that are investing in their podcasting are understanding that this is a brand awareness play. Now, I think... I believe, well, no, I believe that some B2B or some podcast hosts use it for lead generation, which is fine if that is a, a consequence of delivering value to their audience, because I think it's sustainable. Um, but the, what, I've liked, what I have liked seeing recently is more B2B brands starting their own podcast to educate their prospects and their customers on the problems that they're facing. Um, so that's been a really nice surprise. What's really nice about the podcasting industry as well is that it's pretty friendly. You know, people are open to receiving uh, guests. So if you're going, thinking about doing this yourself, you can reach out to podcast hosts. It's very, uh, it's, they're very accessible once you've done your research. Um, and what I've liked from that is the amount of collaboration. So 
you see it's almost like a webinar but it's not it's a it's a longer series in an audio format normally but you have two people that you know may never have spoken before come together share their knowledge and then deliver that value to the audience as well so um that, that that's what i've that's what i've uh, po- seen that's been positive yeah no absolutely and i mean <clears throat> to your last point case in point here we are right <laughs> yeah exactly yeah we um Wait, l- l- let me let me just backtrack a bit and uh, tell you how I found you. I, I mean, I found you through a post um, that you were tagged uh, on um, on LinkedIn, and I think mm-hmm. it was uh, you were having a conversation with uh, James Carberry, and yeah. uh, he spoke very highly of you. So you know, I I, I decided to go and uh, you know ha- have a look, see, and check your profile <laughs> out, and we connected from there, right? So just uh, you know, just that that case in point. Um, you know, and the other one about like uh, friendly collaboration. Yeah, absolutely. I've, you know, uh, I've, I've seen a lot of that myself. I've seen a lot of like B2B brands, uh, not necessarily just podcasting. I mean, you know, some of them decide to go for like the the the, the video cast or the video series and so forth or, or vlogs. Yeah, so. I, I, I whatever, saw. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, Christian. I saw that as a reaction to COVID. So when mm. COVID happened, I saw a huge increase of Gong teaming up with John yes. Barrows to produce some content about remote selling. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, John Barrows being a, a sales trainer, a very good one. Gong yeah. facilitating the ability to coach sales teams remotely, team together to share some value. And what was I, I was a little bit cynical that this wouldn't last. I thought it's, mm-hmm. they're just not 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 those individuals or those companies, right. but just the the uh, the strategy in general. Um, but what's great there's. Um, uh, Scott Lisi and Amy Volus in the sales world, they do Thursday night sales. It's still going. They haven't missed a Thursday uh, since March 2020, and it's still going. And so many people have, uh, they talk so highly of that hour. It's like a happy hour on, on a Thursday. Like, unfortunately for me, it's 3 a.m. for where I am, so I'm not yeah. <laughs> quite awake that, at that time. Yeah. But so many people have really appreciated the connectiveness that it's mm-hmm. given them. That is a webinar, so it's not, but, but I believe podcasting has the same. And there was an article in The Guardian, uh, a newspaper in the UK, which talked about um, podcasts have re- replaced the human connection because it's the storytelling and it's intimate. And there are just so many different formats to uh, to podcasting. And that's one thing that I'm, like, I, I know this industry so well. And the majority of the B2B type of uh, podcasts are interview or conversation styles like this. But there's so many other formats that you could right. you could, you could uh, produce. And there's, that, there's where I think there's a really interesting opportunity for B2B brands. If you've got your competitors or if you've got other people in your in your vertical producing podcasts or, already, it actually doesn't take much to do something different. I don't know if you've seen these ones. The, they're, they're a video podcast, but they send the guest really spicy chili or pepper. And they have, have to eat it. <laughs> they have to eat it and then they have to answer the questions. Um, <laughs> okay, it's an interview. It's a conversation. It's exactly the same as what we're doing now. They just did one thing, which was to post some really, really hot uh, jalapeno or whatever it is that their uh, chilies that they're sending across. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's wildly different. And it, you know, it's one step that they've added in and they've mm-hmm. created a whole new, uh, a whole new format for, for a show. So um, yeah. I, think, I think we're going to see a lot more B2B brands and, and B2C brands being a lot more creative with it. And there are a few companies that uh, I'm familiar with who do some phenomenal work um, on podcast production. So if anybody wants to ask me about those after that, feel free to contact me and ask. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, thanks for sharing that. You gave me such a great idea for the next interview. I'm going to, I'm going to mail the next guest who was somebody you recommended, by the way, I'm going to, I'm going to send them some chilies and ask them to eat those. <laughs> yeah, do it, do it. <laughs> but, you know, sorry, let, let's circle back uh, for a second here um, because you, you mentioned something earlier, which I thought was really interesting and it's probably worth talking about. You, you were, you know, you mentioned that a lot of um, B2B podcasts were in this format, you know, where it's like an interview style, but let, let's, 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 let's have a little bit of a jam about what the other formats are. I mean, I'd imagine there's, there's a bit of solo recording, there's Q and A, there's live consulting, so, 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 something of that nature. Yeah, I, I think live consulting. Um, so uh, Chris Walker at Refine Labs, he often, uh, one of the formats of his podcast is he'll do a discovery call or, or, or like a strategy call with a, cu- with a 
company that he that couldn't afford to work with him, for example. Um, but he still wants to help because, again, he's got that attitude of uh, giving first without expecting anything in return. So they'll record the call. The the obviously the the prospect or the, or the company that's asking for the help knows that it's going to be recorded. Now that person won't reveal really confidential information, but they can say, "Hey, look, we're struggling with our engagement, or we're struggling with our open rates on our emails for whatever reason." Um, that that's one format. Another, I can't remember the name right now, Christian, but I can send it to you after. They did a live marketing audit. So what they, it was really interesting. They had like a spin, spinning wheel with Airbnb, Spotify, Shopify, these huge brands. And then they span the wheel and it stopped. And let's say it stopped on Airbnb. So then they went through and looked at Airbnb's value proposition on their website. They looked at the navigation. They looked at from an SEO point of view to see how well they did. Then they went through the user experience and talked about um, the different user experience of, of, uh, of Airbnb. Then they looked at their social presence and talked about what, could, what they could do. What, if, if they were head of marketing or CMO at Airbnb, what they would do. Now, there's no right or wrong answer with that advice. And obviously they're making that, uh, they're talking about that without any data to, to back up what they're saying. But it's still really interesting to hear how these people are thinking and, and how and, you know, they are a marketing agency. So what a great way to demonstrate their, <clears throat> the value that they could bring by doing like a live teardown of a huge public company that everyone's familiar with. Um, you could do more Q&A. You, so you could collect questions from the, uh, from the audience and, and answer those questions. Um, you could bring in, you could be the, the link between your customers and some other experts as well. Um, someone uh, who is famous in the industry, you could bring them on to answer questions as well. Um, yeah, though I've just made, well, not made those up. Those have just come to my mind uh, in the last 30 seconds. No, absolutely. And, you know, um, thanks for highlighting those. I mean, those, those are definitely some great examples. And yeah, I mean, like, um, I, I think I've seen a few of those where they, they bring somebody on that's, um, that's famous or like, you know, Chris Walker gets featured in a show and then, the, you know, they, they get people to like, um, call in and ask questions. I mean, that's, and, and, and it all goes back to like, how else? What are those other ways that you can think about to continue to add value to that audience out there? And in the world of B2B, that audience that's probably not ready to buy right now, but maybe mm -hmm. they might be in six to 12 months time, right? So you always, yeah. gotta, you always gotta play the long game here, right? So. Yeah, Christian, and I don't wanna go too off topic and I don't yep. want to upset any content marketing agencies, but somebody asked me the other day, how would I plan out the content strategy for a, a B2B SaaS? Mm -hmm. So um, the advice I gave them was, I would think about who I'm trying to sell to, the prospect that I'm trying to sell to. I'd take their job description yeah. and every bullet point of their job description, I'm gonna turn into a chapter of a book. Hmm. Within each chapter, I'm going to talk about, the, talk about the problem of that bullet point, um, different ways to solve the problem, and then maybe give some advice on how to execute on uh, solving that problem as well. Most job descriptions have anywhere between 10 to 15 bullet points. That's 10 yeah. to 15 chapters. Those chapters become my categories on my blog, and then the other pieces of content underneath that become individual blog posts as well. Now you could take that same strategy, yeah. put it into your podcast, and then go and find people that know how to do each of the bullet points in, in the job title. Because I think what a lot of B2B brands yeah. make the mistake of doing is they make their marketing all about their product and their solution. Yes. And there, I just don't, I can't think of, a, and no one's corrected me yet, but I can't think of a software that solves every problem that a prospect will have. So if I'm using Outreach or Gong, mm -hmm. they solve different problems as my role as a, as a VP of sales or chief revenue officer, uh, right. but it doesn't solve everything, but they do create content that talks about how do I hire better sales rep? How do I ramp them up? Um, how do I compensate my sales reps? Again, mm. outreach doesn't provide that solution. It's, it's a sales engagement tool, but they know and they understand that their prospects have other challenges that their product doesn't face. And just simply pushing your features and, and your products just doesn't work. And I just want more and more B2B companies to, to understand that which is why I'm going to stop my rant at this stage. <laughs> it sounds like you've got an idea for a book that is yet to be written, my friend. <laughs> maybe, maybe I do. <laughs> um, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but what is, um, you know, from your perspective, the biggest challenge that the podcasting industry is facing right now? 
Um, I think it's going, well, eventually it will become saturated and like, like most channels, marketers will, will ruin it, uh, in the end. Um, so I think, yes, people will get a bit fatigued with, uh, lots of different, um, podcasts that might be talking about the same thing. Um, so having, that's why having a fresh approach to the format of the show, it will definitely make a difference. And, and also if, if you stay on the pulse with the challenges that your, uh, that your prospects are facing, like for example, two years ago, you would never have seen, uh, for a B2C brand, you have never seen somebody asking you to know about TikTok. Now you do, uh, if you're, if you're selling into the, you know, Gen Z and, and your audience is there. Um, so if, if you as the podcast host are keeping on top of the changes in the industry and the changes that your, your prospects are facing, then you, you will be fine. Um, but yeah, there will be a bit of a, a saturation, but one of the great things is that the, it's an evergreen piece of content and a little bit like you will create a pillar piece of content from, from a blog perspective, your podcast can be the same. And as I mentioned, there are people that are so looking to solve the problems in the future that don't realize that they have that problem just yet. Um, so I think it's still worth the investment because it works for you um, whilst you're not investing any more time in it. So unlike paid ads, where as soon as you turn off the spend, those ads don't appear anymore and you don't drive any traffic to the top of the funnel. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, there's certainly uh, quite a uh, significant amount of forward thinking that needs to be done there, right? So, Yeah, but you don't have to have the answers. And that's what the no. most genius thing about it is. You find the people that have the answers. Yes. And that's what we do. We represent our, our customers because we know that they have the answers to certain topics and we present them in a way yep. that the podcast host says, yes, that's, <laughs> that's the, exactly the type of person we'd like on our show. Right, right. Fantastic. Okay, my friend, this is the bit where you uh, you can get up on the uh, you know on your soapbox and um, Hyde Park <laughs> and talk <laughs> passionately. Um, <clears throat> what is a you know a status quo or a commonly held belief in your area of expertise that you passionately disagree with, and why? Yeah, so it's slightly to the side of uh, podcasting, but it's still content, which essentially is what podcasting is all about, and it's gated content. Um, I do not believe any B2B or any company should be gating any content whatsoever. Um, and it, it blows my mind when companies gate the, uh, the case studies as well, because just because, and, and then also understand that just because somebody downloads a case study doesn't mean they're ready to buy right now. They're just interested in what that case study may have had to say. Uh, and also they might be just doing the research for their VP of sales or whoever it is, is going to be the economic decision maker. Um, so then the qualification criteria on the back end of the, of the B2B brands will be like, well, this person is a marketing executive or a marketing assistant. Therefore, the lead score is very low because the job title isn't what we're looking for. So we're not gonna we're not gonna call them and we're we're not gonna put them in the normal cycle. So I'm going on, I'm riffing on a few things here, but gate, let me go back to gated content. If you put your content behind a, a form, and let's say I think the average um, uh, conversion rate on a on in a B two B is something like six percent or twelve percent. Let's just say it's ten for this illustration. That means that ninety percent of people have landed on that page and thought, nah, I don't want to get, I don't want to give my details to read this piece of content. However, that content could be very valuable for them, but they just know that they're going to give you their email, they're going to give you their phone number, and they're going to get a call, and they don't want to call now. So. Remove the, remove the content, no, sorry, remove the form, let people access the content, don't put the barrier in front of them. And when they're ready, they will come to you. And that's the best time to close a deal is when somebody said, puts their hand up and says, I'm ready to speak to you. Now, of course, you can remarket to them. I think that's still a very effective strategy. You could continue to do top of the funnel content to them as well. Um, but remove the form because no one wants to be put in a nurture sequence or called by an SDR just because they downloaded a white paper about how to relaunch your website. Yeah, no, that's, uh, the, I, I totally agree with you there. And, uh, you, you know, it's like uh, what one thing, it's one thing to like gate the content and it's another, and um, I saw this the other day, like the form appears and there's like 20 fields to fill up. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's unbelievable, right? And, uh, and uh, yeah. And, and the kicker, Christian, is it's the majority of people that download an ebook never actually open and look at the ebook. Isn't they it? just they just do it because, but well, you know, it feels like you're learning, if you, and you have intentions to to yeah. read it. But yeah. you know, you filled out the form, and then you get to a thank you page which says, 
we're sending the ebook to your inbox. Check your inbox out in 10 to 15 minutes. You go, yes. you go and look at your inbox straight away. You've got a message from your boss. They're annoyed at you because you haven't done something. Mm. You jump on that. You forget that that ebook was ever even downloaded as well. Yeah. Whereas you take the content, speak on podcasts, speak on the podcast where people are already listening, already keen to learn, share the value and people will come back. People will come inbound to you. And that's exactly why we do what we do. Amen. <laughs> Amen to that. Mark, you know, uh, this has been such an insightful and informative session. And, uh, you know, like, uh, do us the honor of uh, telling us a little bit about yourself. And, uh, you know, give us a bit of background. What's the story with this? Uh, this you know, We've probably talked about this a couple of times, but for the benefit of the listeners, what's the story about this uh, Fox Cafe that you opened in London? Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I'll quickly give a... So, um, I studied marketing at university. I then got a, a grad job effectively in recruitment. Yeah. Got a little bit bored of recruitment, but it taught me so much about sales and account management. Um, but I really missed the marketing side of things, which is what I studied. So I used my recruitment skills to land myself a job in marketing. Was always the first marketer uh, or first digital marketer. So I got used to building out the website, the CRM, the marketing automation. So I became quite good at marketing automation. Mm -hmm. Got to the age of 29. So I did that for in B2B SaaS companies for about eight years, uh, got to the age of 29, never took a gap year. So I was like, okay, that's it. I'm going to go traveling. Um, so I took all my savings, went to South America for six months, Southeast Asia for six months, but whilst there did a marketing automation project. And I was like, wow, somebody has just paid me to sit in Santiago, Chile, set up their CRM. They gave me a lot of money, more, more money than I ever like received in one go. And I don't, didn't have to be in their office and I didn't have to have an office myself. Like I was in a hostel doing that work. Yeah. Um, I didn't tell them that, but um, <laughs> so, so I, I, I realized that, that, you know, just before I got to 30, that I didn't have to go back to London. I didn't have to go back to the nine to five. I could set up my own business. And then since then I've been on a journey of entrepreneurship where I've either run existing startups or set up my own business and, and run those. And that's where I am today. The Fox Cafe comes to my childish uh, behavior and my immaturity. I love pranks. I love winding friends up. There are certain friends that I am still winding up with jokes at the moment. There's one friend that when I find out he's going to a particular restaurant, obviously when, it's, when it is open, I uh, call ahead of the restaurant and say, look, I can't make it, but it's my friend's birthday. Is there any chance I can pay for a cake uh, to be sent to him? It's never been his birthday when he's in these restaurants, but he gets a cake brought over to, to, to the table. Um, so yeah, I, I'm very, I've got a very immature, childish uh, sense of humor. And I feel like I could be really serious and very knowledgeable when it comes to B2B and work, but yeah. blowing off steam for me is like pranking. So yeah, the long story short is I fooled London into thinking that a cafe was going to open where you could go and pet foxes. Um, it went viral. I had 6,000 people sign up or enter the ballot so they could win tickets. It got featured in the Time Out, Telegraph, Financial Times, The Guardian, all of the media outlets. So I kind of growth hacked my way into getting 6,000 6, people signed up and then the RSPCA and PETA and a few Twitter warriors finally worked out who I was and they threatened to out me. Um, so I pulled the plug. I was never going to go through with it, but mm. it, it was a prank that got a little bit out of, out of hand. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's probably as succinctly as I could I can tell yeah. that story. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's a that that is one heck of a background story, I have to say. And you know, the, the, the rest is history, of course. And you know, here you are, yeah. right? So <laughs> no, fantastic. No, Mark, listen, this has been such a great session. Um, thank you so much for coming on and you know, uh, sharing your your thoughts and experience with us. Uh, what's the best way for people out there to get in touch with you? Sure. So the best place to, to find me is on LinkedIn. So I'm Mark Colgan. Um, there's not too many of, of them there, so I should come up quite easier. Mm -hmm. and, and also, Christian, what we wanted to do for, for listeners um, of your podcast was to offer them a, 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 an offer. So we'd like to um, offer anybody can come to our website and just put in their name, their website and describe their ideal customer. Mm -hmm. And what we'll do is our team will research some podcasts that we think would be great fits for you to speak on and share that with you for free. So we'll do the research. We'll share those results with you. Um, and you can access that by going to speakonpodcast.com forward slash podcasts. So that's speakonpodcast.com forward slash podcast. And yet there's no obligation, although we do need you to fill out the form because we need to know who your ideal customer is. So we can we can uh -huh. do the research. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, fantastic. Fantastic. Mark, um, 
it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. And, uh, you know, thanks again for your time. So take care, be safe, and talk to you soon. Thanks, Christian. Speak to you soon. Take care. Take care. Bye for now. Thank you.